need some kind of advice, man, in this kind of thing that you're doing. But he was so convinced that what he was doing was gold and what nobody gonna top it. And now when he looks back at it, I wonder if he can remember this. Remember this, Mark? You remember this, man? Now that you're older, can you look back and remember how dumb this was, man? You know how you just do $18,000 of my money away on that and then you talking about you blitzing oh he sold me some dreams nigga you sold me the dreams you took my money I ain't took no money from you and for you to call down here asking me for money when you know I'm hooked like a research monkey man don't you ever in your life man never play tough down there man play you know but we don't even want to get into that man get you some bodies up under your belt Start to engage in some hand-to-hand -hand combat where you gotta kill a motherfucker with your hand. And then when you start that hoorah, hoorah shit at your brothers, man, I said, okay, I understand it, cause the niggas a killer for real. You sold me $18,000 worth of dreams and then said I couldn't get my money, man, because some dude beat you out of it. Beat you out of hundred and something thousand dollars. If a dude beat you out of hundred and something thousand dollars, what is he doing living, man? What is he doing walking the street, man? A motherfucker ain't gonna beat me out of ten dollars, man. And breathe another breath. They just called my spirit skip because he didn't take nothing from nobody, you know. After I left uh, St. Louis Obisco, I heard shortly after that skip, uh, skip got shot because they called him to uh, uh, the chapel, you know, to tell it that uh, one of his family members had got killed, you know. And he couldn't mentally skip when Abraham left. So he went out in the yard and some stirred up and scar shot him. That's in uh, St. Louis Bisco. Then he got uh, stabbed a couple times, I think with solid dead. But I got to give props. I got to give props to the people who lost because the dudes that lost to me were some tough dudes, man. It wasn't, oh, he wasn't nothing but a punk. Hell no. How would I go going and kill a punk? These motherfuckers were some vicious dudes, man. All had bodies, man. You know, so I give props to them, man, because it's going to happen to me. You know, it's going to happen to me. And when a dude finally takes me out, I don't want him to be saying, you know, old punk ass, no, I got that nigga. I want him to say, hey, man, the dude was a motherfucker sold you to the end. You know? I just got the ups on him. Coming out of the crack house. <laughs> That's why I eat pork. I smoke cigarettes. I drink. Because on my autopsy report, there will be no mention of cigarettes. They ain't even mention pork or alcohol or drug use. They're gonna say cause of death, gunshot wounds. <laughs> so dude asked me, Skip man, why you eating that pork chop? Pork chop ain't gonna kill me unless a, a nigga beat me in the head with it. Now I'm at this point now that I'm so scary that a dude can't threaten me. Cause I know, I know that the luckiest man in the world is one who got pre-warned, who's pre-warned. You know, if a dude tells you on Sunday, he says, man, this is Sunday. Wednesday, nigga, I'm gonna kill you. That nigga never see Wednesday. My grandmother used to always say, son, you're going to reap what you sow. If I'm really going to reap what I sow, I'm going to kill me for real. For real, vicious. So if do tell me ahead of time, no, nigga. Oh, nigga, you want to see me? Yeah, well, come over to the park. Nigga, we'll never make it to the park. That nigga is done getting in the car. He was just a very touchy person, you know, you, you would... You almost, at times, you wouldn't know how to treat him, you know, because he would flash. You know, he had a tendency to flash. But he was mostly into uh, uh, fighting and violence and stuff like which, you know, that's not my scene. And usually when, uh, when you go to school and you, you see a fight, he say, fight, fight. You know how kids go around a big circle? And nine out of ten times, my brother be down at the bottom of it. All I can say about my pops is he taught me Two things, uh, when I was 13, 14, after he had been absent in my life for about 10 years, wondering what was going on. I knew he was in prison. Um, 
I went out there to uh, Taunton, Massachusetts, where he was in a maximum security at prison. And uh, he told me not to ever let a man take anything from me. And I never have. Um, if I'm ever going to be with somebody, it's because I want to. And if I'm ever going to give anybody anything, it's because I want it. Uh, don't let someone say I had that because it's me that's having something. Um, and the number two thing is how to knock somebody out. And I was a, a thug before Tupac was born. You know, I, I was thugging. And, and, and their philosophy was that uh, anybody selling drugs was uh, an enemy of the people. Anybody that was pimping hogs was an enemy of the people. You know that. And it was all of my friends, man. It was all of my friends. That was what all of my friends was doing, man. Either selling drugs or pimping hogs. When they brought Elgis Cleaver back from, I forgot which country he was in, but we was up in the Oakland County Jail. And we end up fighting about a radio. Me and the legendary Elgis Cleaver. But ain't nobody made no goddamn books about me. Elgis Cleaver, to me, was a, a revolutionist. You know, uh, they talk about revolution. You know, they talk about, you know, and they rally and they, they strike people's emotions and, and make them do things, man. You know, but as far as actuality, on the battlefield, in the trenches. Uh, Elgis Cleaver didn't put in no work, you know, in my opinion. Uh, when they surrounded that house over there in West Oakland and killed the other black pastor, uh, Elgis Cleaver came out buck naked, buck naked, yeah, hands up, surrendering. You know, I, I think he got booked naked so the police couldn't say that he, they thought he had a gun. I was a little special tank, man, for high profile cases. I don't know why I was back there, but they brought uh, Elgis Cleaver back in. And plus somebody said he was telling on somebody. I don't know, man. But anyway, I used to turn on the radio up real loud. And the radio just so happened to be in front of his cells, only four cells, five cells. And so he would come out for his time for the shower and he would turn the radio down. And I felt somewhat offended because that was my area back there. And at that time, uh, I don't know if you remember the SLA, a little dude named Bill Harris, who was uh, the one to kidnap, or allegedly kidnap, well, he did kidnap, <laughs> Patricia Hurst. Oh yeah, that's another dude I met, become real friends with. As a matter of fact, I named my daughter after one of the SLA members, Emily Harris. But uh, uh, Elgis Cleaver would come and turn the radio down, man. I then turn the station, man, to some jazz type. And I wasn't sophisticated back then, you know, to understand jazz, uh, Rossan, Rolling Kirk, and what's that bird do, man? something bird but uh and so anyway man uh i said hey man why don't you put uh mess with that radio partner you know and he said something kind of flip man i said something flip back man and so we end up coming out both at the same time and elders cleveland was taller than me and so i did what they do in the wwf i bent down and scooped him up and body slammed him of course, at this point, I was told that he was one of the Black Panthers, that my life was no longer worth a damn. Yes, yeah, me and Elgis Cleaver had a fight. Not much of a fight. He, his back hit the dirt, and that was about it. My parents and I, we moved a lot, so we were always the new guys at school. And uh, it, was, it was very nerve-wracking because your mother tells you, hey, well, you know, watch your brother's back. And, uh, you know you have to because you know you know you're gonna get beat down if you don't when you get home. So uh, it was it was one of them things that uh, uh, I wouldn't wish, wish it on nobody, man. It was it was uh, it was a nightmare, really. You know, I didn't like it. Me 
Me and my boy Bobby Joe, I was in cell nine, and he was in cell two. So we would sit up all night, hollering, talking. You know, I was waiting for my chick to come. He was waiting for his broad to come. And so we would be using a, man, if this bitch, man, don't show up, man, this bitch better bring me some money, bah, 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 bah. You know, talking about hoes and cat like those. And so, man, early in the morning, man, they start showering. And I hear these chains coming down the tear, man. And uh, this big light-skinned dude, I was in the sink washing my face, and this light-skinned dude stopped. Man, I never forget the words he said. Exact words, exact words. He says, brother, was that you and your homeboy talking last night? I said, yeah, yeah, matter of fact, it was. And he says, brother, we don't refer to our sisters as bitches on this tear. We don't allow the white man to occupy the cavity of our sister's thighs. And I suggested you and your homeboy park them Cadillacs before you get them wrecked. And you stroll on off, man. At this time, I thought the whole world revolved around fighting and had me having a decent close quarter knuckle drilling game. I go to what they call cell soldiering. I start hollering down the tear. I said, Bobby Joe, you see that great big old piss colored nigga, man? Motherfucker don't know, I'll fuck him up, man. Cause I'll whoop these old ass niggas to death. And now the old dudes, when I was calling old man, it was like 26, 27, 29, 30. On, uh, in this adjustment center then was uh, Fleet of Drumco, John Clichet, Louis Talamanzi, uh, Willie Tate, all of these dudes, man. All of them would end up being charged with the killings of police and that thing. There's books and books and books written about it. About several police being killed that day. Anyway, that was George Jackson. That was George Jackson. And what happened is that later that evening, on a line, like if a guy got a note for somebody, he'll throw a bar of soap and you would see a long string tied on it. And then you see the dude pull the string and the little note will go by there. They were discussing my life. It was dude said, George, man, you look here. We'll deal with this brother, man. The one that was uh, disrespecting you today because we'll kill this nigga, man, as soon as we get to the yard. And I know to this day that George Jackson spared my life because he was saying, I mean, this dude has got some potential, man. Uh, and he said, you know, I was over my head. I was over my head. I didn't know them dudes uh, was uh, armed and dangerous, but I was over my head and he spared me when he could have just waved his hand and my head would have rolled like an NBA basketball around like this. I have since that time given other young black dudes a break. They don't have no idea who they talking to. They don't know if I got a nine in my pocket. They don't know if I'm capable of killing them or just hitting them right in the in the windpipe with a knife. They don't know. And they be sitting up selling murder. Motherfucker! And I've given them passes because George, that day, gave me a pass. One, he's shooting Heron. And, uh, you know, a lot of Heron addicts don't live that long a lot of times. And uh, he, he's, in the, he's in the fast lane. He's in the fast lane of life. Robbing banks and stealing and, you know, and uh, just, you know, that, 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 that thug life, which uh, usually you don't retire at 65 from. Just going to visit him in prison, man. Just that's the most thing I remember about my dad is prison. That's the biggest pictures in my head is them. In the 70s, they had what was called unmandated sentencing laws, and my father was partially responsible for taking that to the Supreme Court and finding it unconstitutional. So the police in East Oakland really didn't like my father. Uh, one day, they came to pick him up for a, a alleged homicide and took him away, came back, and took my mom. But they didn't take her down to the station. They took her uh, to a designated area and uh, four police officers raped her and beat her up and uh, put a pistol in her mouth. And um, he was about to shoot my mom. And another officer said, man, what you gonna waste your bullet on that bitch for? Uh, who she gonna tell? And, you know, my mom been singing country music ever since. I was sitting by the river Talking with the spirit of love I was just wondering about angels Where had they 
all gone Then came a man Who wanted to marry me So he took me home To meet his parents in Tennessee I'm one of the only few black dudes that ate pork in prison. It's not popular to eat pork in prison. Now a dude can smoke crack, smoke cigarettes, do all of that. But then, I don't eat no hogs. That showed that you were still brainwashed, man. Eat pork. And they took a dude that was real secure of who he was. Okay. Sit up at the table, you know, some of them prisoners with a plate full of pork chops. While everybody was gritting at it. Who that nook? Eating them pork chops. But I have part of this man that's uh, been eating pork. Most of my friends that stopped eating pork are dead now. Maybe they should have had, had a little more pork to their guy. It was kind of rough because, you know, when, when Father and Son Day at the baseball games came, you know, we had to take each other. Charles Smash. Uh, Try to throw some pee on me, man. You know, that was the big thing in, uh, in them lockup units, man, was to. Uh, White dudes, man, especially white dudes. Brothers started to get into it later, too. We called it chemical warfare. When you was throwing piss and human feces on somebody, man, you know. One of the highest forms of disrespect that you can give a person is to throw some human feces in their face, man. But anyway, Charles Manson tried to uh, throw uh, some. It, it missed me. But he tried to throw some pee on me one day, man, behind uh, an argument that went down and shit. And this dude is built just like a girl, man. Built like a 12-year-old girl. We was in this unit in uh, Vacaville. And Charlie used to, uh, Charlie used to sing an uh, old country and western song to my, Good time, Charlie's got the blue. While Kenny was in prison, Skip's mother started seeing another man, who she married shortly after Kenny's death. Relatives and those closest to Skip believe that these events led directly to Skip's lifelong mistreatment of women. He was very uh, uh, brutal. He would he would hit me and stuff, and so I, that was one of the reasons why you know he took me with him to Oakland because he didn't want my mom to see that he had hit me in my hit me in my eye and I had a black eye and he had busted my lip so he couldn't let me go home like that because he was really afraid of my mom. When he got out of prison the second time and uh, I was leaving because I told him you know I couldn't live like that anymore we were living in Fresno in this apartment and he was I think he was like running drugs and running prostitutes and he beat me unconscious, knocked my teeth out. Everybody need anger management because everybody ain't raised right. And everybody get angry. Everybody parents, everybody family, everybody grandparents didn't raise their parents to raise them to where they don't get angry. And anger and violence is not acceptable amongst human beings because what it does is create a situation where man kills man and if man did not kill man there is no other life form on earth that would kill man so therefore we would only die of natural causes it's murder and natural causes that's it that's the only way you could die i think that's probably why on the east coast they call everybody son hey son hey son because nobody got no father what you want? Uh, it's right here. Oh, there, yeah. Right there. I have two pots. Father, 
Dr. Matula Shakur. That's Juju from St. Louis. That's Celine from Alabama. And that is Mr. Muscle and Fitness himself, Skip Johnson. I mean, speaking about Tupac, Pops, man. Uh, hell of a dude, man. You know, during those revolutionary days, a revolutionary woman would uh, have sex with any of the brothers, man, that needed. I guess that's how they, they got out. You know, if they was on the run, it was four brothers and two chicks that had to go underground. They was hiding in some room in the house or something, man. And it all sounds from New York. She, uh, I mean, they would, uh, not uh, let somebody monopolize him. All them soldiers needed sex. So I think that's what Tupac uh, father was saying. He says, who actually put the seed in her? She has never said. She has never told anybody. And Tupac has made issues out of that. That, you know, he still don't know exactly who his father is. Man. Uh, but this is the one that spent formative years with Tupac, uh, uh, whether uh, he was on the run, underground, pulling bank robbers, he's the one that introduced uh, Tupac to the revolutionary philosophy. As you can always tell Tupac is talking about, you know, the people and what they need. But when the baby was born, Tupac was born, this was the man that was there. This was the man who gave his name so Tupac can have a name so and we've discussed Tupac many 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 times man uh, I went to Atlanta Georgia on the 26th of November uh, and met Tupac's mother uh, This he was releasing a compilation I was there participating in that uh, and we discussed Tupac all the time man. Uh, and people were asking him man is Tupac really dead you know and what I can remember him saying is that Tupac could not live his life on some island or in some cave. He just ain't cut like that. Uh, and he would definitely be at his mother's house on Thanksgiving. So for anybody who says, man, uh, Tupac's still living, still alive, that's kind of like disrespecting his mother because his mother has not seen Tupac. Tupac is dead, man. People do get killed. He took me up in the hills in Oakland. We jump out the car and go pull a shotgun out the trunk and shoot the shotgun in this field and then jump in the car and drive off. We used to be on the run and stuff because you know my dad had all kind of enemies and you know what I'm saying he killed somebody and you know I mean he wasn't just killing people just to be killing people but he was out there in the game and when you're in the game it's insane. When he got out of prison the first time. And he went over to uh, some dope dealer's house and robbed him and then came back to where we were staying, where I was staying, was down by the lake in Oakland. And in the meantime, he had moved his supposed first ex-wife into a house one block away from where I lived and then because these people were after all of us to kill us because they knew we were all his family we were all in this apartment it was on the second floor and um, he shot into the house and killed some killed him supposedly accidentally but and then that's what he went to that's what he went to prison for. He was the type of person that would give you the clothes off the 